Hello, and welcome to one of my videos where I rant about how people think. And today's topic is one that I think about a lot and one that I wish I could make a really high quality, awesome, mathematically intensive video about. But it's good to, to get the concepts kind of out there and talk about them. Um, I wonder if I should have my signs in view, Inspiration Basic. I recently paid off a card that I had taken out a few years ago just to make this app. And um, I'm currently developing... Still can't get this right. I'm currently developing this one. Um, and the basis for those apps is basically parse tree editing. So... Um, I worked at a company called Runtime Verification, and they understood the concepts of having a formally verified or defined programming language. But their concept of a programming language came from industry. It didn't come, I don't think, necessarily that much from math. Now, they did have some people who were good at math and some math involved with it, but I don't think their understanding was purely math. If it was they wouldn't be trying to take languages like C and things like that um, that aren't already formally defined. They, they would just create their own language and um, go with that and create a useful, practical version of something that most people, not many people would um, know. Um, or mathematically intensive language, something that more, more people would know about would be ha like Haskell. <clears throat> so that's kind of my background. That's where I'm coming from right now. Just for income, I build houses. I, I, I deliver pizzas. I just do simple stuff right now. I deliver. I drove semi trucks for a little bit after I worked at that company. Um, they wanted me to do testing. There was an MIT professor who was quality assurance, and he thought that I just wasn't good or whatever or something. And I never claimed to be good at C or Bash or anything like that. I just wanted to do math. And I guess based on my transcripts, I'm not good at math or something. I don't know. But I want to do math. So regardless of what anyone thinks, I always liked math. And I'm going to create things with math because that's what I appreciate. And there's a reason for that. Math is different. In fact, if I had to describe it in one word. That's almost how I would describe it. And uh, for thousands of years, people would describe God as whole. Well, the term holy actually means different. That's literally like what it means. It means set apart. It means different. So whether that means non-finite or I don't know what that really would mean in terms of like scientific you know, analysis, how that converts. Um, but the idea that we have of functions or, or singularities, like black holes and things like that, that's a, that's a significant idea because that's where a physical model breaks down, which means that, usually means that something different is happening that's not explained by your model. So you, if you have some equation that explains gravity and then you have like this black hole with a singularity, that means that something different is happening there that's not explained by your gravity equation. There's something quantum going on. There's something different, basically. Um, and math isn't always intuitive. So math, you know, will trick people. And I, I kind of had a mathematical mind since I was young. And I'll explain a really good example um, of how it's not intuitive to most people. Um, and even to me, sometimes it's not, you know... You, you, you can misrepresent things. Um, so you don't necessarily get everything incorrect, but you use something that you know that's correct to then incorrectly inference about it to get an incorrect statement. So for example, uh, I've, know, I've argued with some people about dropping heavy objects into light objects, and there's people that say, well, no matter what, you know, if it's the same shape, they'll fall at the same speed. And given, you know, air friction, and, well, in a vacuum, we know that everything falls at the same, basically the same speed, regardless of whether it's big or small, because, you know, 
regardless of whether molecules are connected together, they're all being pulled at the same time. It doesn't matter whether they're connected. They're all just being pulled at a constant acceleration. Now, it's kind of intuitive to think, well, if two things are the same shape, maybe it doesn't matter what size they are. As long as they're both a sphere, maybe they're both made out of pure copper, they'll have the same air friction. Well, there's a problem with that, and you're kind of just assuming that size doesn't matter, when it actually, it does, in your context. Um, if you're trying to define whether to, if you're trying to calculate whether an object is going to fall faster given air friction in a constant clock, um, it turns out that the way you quantify everything, size does matter because um, there's a relative, I don't know if it's relative to the how you measure time or what, or how things, how you want to define things to scale. But you'd have to scale time itself or space itself to account for this. The reason is, is because the surface area of an object, basically what I'm saying is a larger, ob a larger, if you have a larger copper sphere, or ball, not sphere, but a, a full ball that's bigger than another one that's also a ball shape but it's smaller and there's wind resistance or there's air and you drop them both maybe from standing height they'll hit the ground basically at the same time but if you drop them from like an airplane the larger one will go at a much faster rate eventually because its terminal velocity is much higher because they're both of their accelerations are the same but the larger ball has a lot less surface area compared to its total mass. So it has more total surface area, but it has even more total mass. And the surface area, when you get make something bigger, um, only is squared compared to the diameter or the radius. You know, either one, pick, pick one. But the mass is gonna be related to it cubed. Now, if you take a cube and you cut it into eight slices, what you've done is you've not increased the mass at all, but you've increased the surface area. And I've had someone tell me, no, nah, you can't just do that. You can't, you can't prove your idea that a larger object will fall faster given air friction, you know, from an airplane, which I'm adding that to make sure that there's not any confusion. You can't just do that by slicing it and then count it as a set of eight objects versus one object. And I was like, wow, why can't you? That actually makes perfect sense. You have more surface area. Why does it matter if something's connected that has nothing to do with it falling different? So wh why can't you treat them as a set? So he, he actually was thinking that you couldn't just assume something. And I've had people think that too. It's kind of funny. I've had someone um, think, oh, you can't just start you know, a math proof with A equals B. Yes, you can. You can assume any, th any axiom you want because the whole proof is only built on the axioms. People think that, they people who understand f truth and facts and science, they don't really understand math proofs very well a lot of times. And it's kind of scary because they know how to do math because they're forced to kind of do it in school, but they don't really know how to do proofs correctly. Proofs are different. They're, the reason why they work is because they separate out the truth from everything else. That's why they work. And people are used to thinking that, oh, you have to, you know, everything, you have to look at all the truth at once. But the whole point is, is, it, is you're separating out the error. That's the whole way that math works. It's, it's basically, what it really comes down to is these finitely lengthed computations or proofs at least formal math. I'm not talking about just math as an idea of, you know, if you want to you know, be good at imagining or you're really good at statistical guessing and things like that, you know, that's kind of in the realm of, of thought. And I'm not just talking about, you know, all concepts related math, but I'm just talking about math proofs that by themselves, formal um, analysis. They're extremely dependable. They're actually the only thing that's 100% dependable. Um, in their own way, it's like a different quality. You can't talk about something else 
Everything else is 0% dependable on the, in the way that they are 100% dependable. That's how, di that's how different it is. It's completely disjoint way of doing science. Um, and some people don't get that. They want to mix math and science and things like that. And then they'll make mistakes. There was a guy who made a mistake uh, thinking that, you know, a compression algorithm, you know, to compress files to make them smaller, it's kind of like reducing entropy or something like that. And you can always kind of, you can come up with one that just makes files smaller. But that's not true because the pigeonhole principle proves that you it's impossible to make something, no matter what it is, always smaller. Because, and the proof of that is very, very simple. If you have 64 bits, that means there's 62 to the 64 possible files. Okay. That means your compression algorithm has to output something for every one of those two to the 64 output files uniquely. So what that proves is, is that the output of it has to at least have two to the 64 possible outputs, which means to get all of the outputs with this in the smallest number of bits, you would need two to the 64. You, you couldn't reduce the information by one single bit. Um, so that means that if your compression algorithm makes some files smaller, it would have to make some files bigger. That's all it says. It doesn't say how much bigger. In fact, I can show you how to make it just one bit bigger, but it has to make some of them bigger by at least one bit. It's how it works. That's the truth. And it's more, you can be more sure of that than anything you know about physics. You can be more sure of that than knowing that the earth is round and the sun is a burning ball of gas instead of a hologram because it's only math. It doesn't depend on someone's testing of something. It doesn't depend on knowing if somebody's tricking you or not. It's just math by itself. So your brain itself would have to be compromised. Your, your thought process itself would have to be the, the compromised thing in order for that to be a mistake but it's it's formally verified so it's like super explicit um so basically if your thought process was that compromised it would be you couldn't trust you couldn't even think hmm i want to drink a glass of water because you're you know you by the time you say water how do you know you didn't make up the past and you didn't actually say i want to drink your whole thought process would be super far gone um, in order for math itself as an inferencing tool to be compromised. So, you know, and it, it also goes the positive way too. So it's not just people saying you can't assume that, but there's also things that people just don't notice. Like I played this game, it's called StarCraft, and I played the first version of that game, the first... Uh, there's StarCraft Classic, and then there's StarCraft 2. So I'm talking about StarCraft Classic. And there was a custom map, and you would follow a path. Um, your AI bots would follow a path and fight the other team. So you'd have three guys versus three guys, and you would just build things to fight the other team. And I did some calculations, and I told my teammates, I said, you know what? Build this unit. Build build these spaceships right here. Just build those only. Now, the spaceships, they were pretty expensive, and they didn't have too much firepower. But I knew one special thing about them. They could pile up on each other. So you, instead of just being limited to having 10 or 20, you could have 10,000 of them, basically, in one spot. And eventually, I knew that eventually, if you had enough in one spot it would overcome everything else um, even though they were more expensive and had less firepower so i told my teammates hey just keep making these now the enemy eventually they came through and it looked like they were starting to destroy us now they were caught in a corner and they weren't actually destroying us completely but they they were starting to destroy us and my teammates looking at the situation they actually th must have thought Wow, they, dude, there's a word they got us beat. And they both quit, both of them. They both quit. So it was just me 
and only one person's resources versus three other teams that looked like they were going to destroy us enough to where my, my teammates even quit. And what happened was I still beat all three other teams just by sticking to my strategy. I just kept building the spaceships even though I was building one third as many as I would have built with the, my two teammates. I still beat all three other teams or three players on the, on the other team because that's how accurate, how strong my math actually was in that situation, how true it actually was, um, that even the bias um, that they had, even though even if it was just slight, and they even even though they quit, I still beat the other team. So it just goes to show it was not intuitive for them. It's. People don't understand because they think in terms of what they believe is the truth. And they don't understand the actual underlying math going on. And this happens, I'm going to bring this down to my one point, this happens with statistics and racism and justice, basically. So... There's people, most people out there, I would say, would think that if you say race X has a higher crime rate, right, than race Y. Eh, that sounds kind of racist. Wait, how is that racist? It's just a statement. First of all, it's just a statement. Could be a good thing, could be a bad thing, whatever, but by itself, it's just a statement. In fact, it could just be, this is what is measured, you know. But even if it, you knew that it was true, is that still, with that is that statement racist? Well, let's think about it more. What? Why do people think that's racist? Maybe because they think that what they're supposed to do is take everything they hear and just take actions based on it. So they think, well, if this person, person A, is up for trial to commit to have committed a crime. And person B is also up for trial for the exact same crime in another universe. But in universe A, we have person of race. We'll just call it race A. And in universe B, it's actually race B that is up to trial. Now, all the other races are the same. But the difference in the two universes is... Everything is in, everything in the universes are the same, except in one universe you have someone of race A up to trial, and in one universe you have someone of race B up to trial. Now, here's the here's the statement. The statement person in universe A was more likely to have committed the crime just because of his just because of his race is that racist think about it for a second think about it for a second is it racist to say person a is more likely to have committed a crime than person b where everything else is the same, but only the race is different. Okay. Based on the probability of, of certain race committing, committing a crime, you would say that that's a true statement. If you're just basing your inferencing off the probability statement. Now, if I'm assuming a specific universe with a specific crime, either he did or he didn't, in my assumption. So you're, you might be asking me, well, are you assuming universes where he committed the crime or not? Because you said everything else is the same, so that means his crime is the same, right? Right, but we're playing the part of the jury and the judge, where we don't really know. We just know that the universes are the same. That's what we're told by, just imagine, you know, God tells us the universes are the same, but I'm not telling you whether this guy committed the crime. But I'm also telling you the probability precisely, like God is telling us, this guy has 
0.5% chance of committing the crime. This guy has 90% chance of committing the crime. Okay, since God told us, why don't we just go with that, you know? But if you think about it, that also is just inferencing. Now, we didn't judge anyone yet. We just looked at the probability of whether the person committed the crime based off of their race, right? That's all we did. So we didn't judge them. We didn't say innocent or guilty. We just guessed the probability. Now, think about this for a second. If you roll a die, what's the chance that it comes up as a three? Eh, you probably say, most people would probably just be like, okay, I guess it's one in six chance. Okay. That statement only makes sense when you have a situation where you roll multiple die. But if only one die was rolled in the entire universe one time, its number is only going to pop up once. Okay, this sounds really trivial, but I'm trying to make a point about what this, the statements that are going on here. When you're calculating the probability of something happening, it's totally different than taking action based on what you think is tr the most probable thing. That's a very different thing. It sounds like they'd be the same, but it's not. It sound, Most people would say, well, if there's more than 50% chance that he's guilty, we'll go with that. But hold on, what about innocent until proven guilty? Just doesn't it need a 100% chance? But as a mathematician, aren't I always telling you that you can't be 100% certain about everything? Hmm... What is really going on? Okay, so there's more concepts and statistics that generalize this even more. So think about two universes, or a whole set of universes. What are, And you roll die in all the universes. You roll 10,000 dies in each universe. And all the universes are just a little bit different. Probability is telling us that only a few universes are going to have all 10,000 rolls pop up as a one. But many universes are going to have a mixture of ones and sixes and lots of fours and threes and whatever. Or wait, well, it's, we're roll, if we're rolling one die, then they're all equal. But if, if we're adding two die, never mind. The point is, is that there's a general, there's a more general question going on. And when you decide whether someone's innocent or guilty... You're not just deciding the probability. You're deciding what happens to them. You're deciding, oh, they go to jail. Okay, so get this. Universe A, Universe B. We're going to say, now we know. We're looking at a higher perspective. We're not the judge anymore. We're not the jury. So, and we can't tell them any hints. But now... We, get, we have a higher perspective, and we look at the situation, and we see, hmm, we know that in both universes, the man did not commit the crime. He's innocent. But the judge and jury don't know that. But we know that they're, they're innocent, okay? Now, in universe A, they're of race A. In universe B, they're of race B. Now, remember, race A is, you know, we're, we're going to say that one's considered way more likely to have committed the crime. But race B, no. Hardly ever commit the, that crime. Okay. So we're looking down at the situation. We know in both cases that he's innocent. But we know that the judge and the jury are going to think way more likely that it's going to... that in universe A that they would say that the man is guilty. Now think about this for a second. Think about this. Now, in universe A, they say that man is guilty. In universe B, they say that man, we're going to think that he's innocent. Okay? Universe A, the man goes to jail. Universe B, man gets set free. What happens to the race? To the, to, to the two different races. What, how are the races themselves affected by this? Think about it. 
now you have now sp keep splitting the universes but you have some some situations where somebody committed the crime and some situations where they didn't but in each case in each case it's going to be the same but we, we're going to account for the probability okay so think about this for a second both cases the man was innocent right but even though we they chose to do what was probabilistically most likely to be correct they created a false positive for race a but they did not create a false positive for race b now think about it this way too <clears throat> both case universes the man is guilty Now they've correctly put man A in prison, but man B, now they have a false negative. So now, if you think about it, in the, based on what could happen, <clears throat> either race A is going to have more people in prison than need to be, or race B is going to have more people set free than should, right? Bait. Now, that's going to happen either way. You can't get rid of the false positives and false negatives. But relative to each other, race A is going to have more false positives than race B. And race B is going to have more false negatives than race A. So now you've, now, be, based on using the truth that one race is more likely to commit a crime than the other race, you've just skewed the false positives and the false negatives. This is what is known as a statistical bias. Okay, It's using correct information in a way that's actually incorrect. Okay, And this is, this is the source of some really deep debates that go on. And really smart people think that we should use what's called Bayesian statistics or Bayesian thinking because it makes perfect sense to an engineer. Bayesian inferencing makes perfect sense to an engineer because they want to use all the information they can and they want whatever is the most probabilistically true statement and then they make their decision based on that because that's the highest expected value. That's like you want to invest your money and you're, you want to make the most money possible. So, or you're a robot exploring Mars and you want to take in as much information as you possibly can take to not crash or not run out of battery or something like that. And then there's another kind of a subtle situation here. There's another thinking situation called frequentist and they use less information. They actually will not look at all the information and say, well, we're going to use statistics based on, you know, some of the information, but not all of it. So, for example, they might not look at what someone's race is when they're trying to determine whether they committed a crime. Now, here's the kicker. It sounds like they're not smart. Like, why would you just use less information? It, has, it doesn't have something to do with the fact that they're trying to get more accurate statements they're, as far as probabilistically. They're not looking at one situation to see if one person was likely to commit one crime. They're not looking at that. They're looking at a bigger picture. They're looking at an entire picture with what's called a distribution. So... You, if you've studied statistics, you've heard of normal distribution, Ziff's distribution, things like that. They're looking at something where their decisions, when you add up all their decisions together, so you're adding up all the judges and juries, looking at all the crimes, all combined to put together. They're looking at the situation of how do we treat basically everyone in this we try to get a decently accurate measurement of whether people committed a crime but we don't try to punish people 
for having certain attributes that are not related to the crime. For example, their race or their interests. Think about this for a second. Let's say the US government is looking for a hacker and they look at me and they say, well, this guy's 90% you know, into coding. So since the other people in this group are not into coding, we're just gonna throw him in jail. Now, more likely, if they're looking at an entire group of people and I'm the only one who codes computers, most likely they are correct. But the cost of them being incorrect outweighs the chance of me being the culprit, if that makes any sense. So the frequentists, they're not using Bayesian thinking, they're not using Bayesian statistics. The frequentists, what they're doing is they're, they are sacrificing being correct more of the time for being more fair. And this is real math. This isn't this isn't false fair. This isn't like they're making things up or being they're being um, they're just purposely getting things wrong. It's not that. They are looking at the statistics itself of the likelihood of them being how the cost of them actually being incorrect by using more information and looking at the cost of them being incorrect by not using the information and they're comparing those two and reducing the total the total damage basically so what they are doing makes sense frequentist statistics is not just this like old fashioned, old vague, like weird way of thinking. It's just not what engineers usually deal with because engineers usually solve specific construction type problems. Engineers usually look at a problem and they try to find the most probably correct answer and base it off that. Like if I wanted to code a computer program to play the game 2048, which I have, that's how I coded it. I coded it to use all the information it could. And then based on the probability of what was going on or the expected value, it made its decision. But in this situation, you have to look at the goal. So is the goal to put the this person in prison based on how likely they are to have committed the crime. Which sounds good. That sounds like it's correct. But it's not. You want to put the person in prison based on a frequentist analysis. A flat analysis on whether they committed the crime. That's what I'm saying. So I'm saying your criterion, your, what you are doing as a jury and judge, what you want to do is actually different. You want to weigh, you don't want to just, you want to weigh the cost of what you're doing. Because you could make a false positive or a false negative. You could in any any of these situations, I'm assuming in any situation, they don't really know 100% for sure what's going on. They could always mistake something. They could always be really sure that somebody committed a crime or didn't commit a crime, but they could have made a mistake somewhere. And if they're using information of this person is good at coding, well, they should be rewarded for being good at coding, not be more likely to be thrown in prison, right? Think about that. Being good at coding would put you more likely to, to go in prison then if people inference that way. But we need people who are good at coding. But we also need people who commit crimes to go into prison, right? So there's like, there's a give or take there. So if you made like this very simplified computer program that just tries to guess true or false whether someone committed a crime, it would be very racist. It really would. And it would actually cause the race 
the races to 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 split it would cause the races to be treated unfairly and probably even cause the race itself to commit more crimes or to be a higher crime committing race so people who think that the math is racist they don't realize it but they actually are the racist ones because they're the ones who are not applying statistics properly the people who understand the strength of frequentist statistics and why and where it has an advantage over bayesian statistics and who just know that math and statistical statements and facts are just that they're just math statements and statistical facts and that's all they are and when they realize that that it's human bias which is which is actually the racist racism not the math but the human bias and the mistaking of math or the wrong application of math or even the incorrect application of correct math that's what's racist so if you know anyone who you know is afraid of statistics or even the other way if you know people who are like well statistics say that that race is worse and therefore i'm going to ju you know both of them are wrong think about that both of both sides of that are wrong as soon as he says so i'm going to judge that's where he makes his mistake he's correct in saying the statistic is correct that's fine but measure the cost of and how you apply the statistic so when you judge whether someone did a crime you should not actually look at their race um but if you are a police officer if you are if you're trying to decide whether to make a friend same thing don't don't base it off their race if you're deciding whether you want to hire someone don't base it off their race okay but if you're a police officer downtown in some inner city and you're treating everyone with respect okay and you don't trust one race a little more than the other race then it's okay to be more cautious around the race that you don't trust as much not to distance yourself from people but because you're not costing them anything by being cautious okay so as long as you're not being super overly cautious where you are basically wasting your resources because you're around one race versus another race then it's then that's okay because now you're using bayesian inferencing you're using your human bias in an okay way because we have we're all biased at some point to do anything practical you have to have some bias if you actually look at this just the straight math you can't be, you basically can't do anything practical whatsoever without some bias somewhere um so if you're treating everyone equally and you're open to having any race as your friend and you treat everything like that as flat that's fine um if that makes any sense i don't know if people are going to understand that or understand what i'm saying because i i did say you know in a specific way that you could treat two races differently but you're not really treating them differently you're you're just making sure that you're cautious around one race versus another race when you're comp for example when i was in japan I knew that I could trust people outside of the military base more than I could trust people on the inside of the military base. Now, in both cases, I would, you know, keep an eye on my wallet, make sure that my cell phone didn't get stolen, make sure that, you know, no one could just take my car keys and run off with my car. But see, I didn't really expect that to happen outside of the military base because I knew those people were very peaceful where I was, even more peaceful than the people inside the military base, ironically. But that didn't mean that I treated the people inside the military base any worse. It didn't mean that I didn't try to make friends with anyone inside the military base less than I would with people outside the military base. It just mean it just meant that I didn't have to be as 
cautious. Now, that if you were overly cautious with someone, it will cost them indirectly because now you're wasting your own resources. And you're sh and it's you're doing it due to them, which indirectly hurts them. I'm not going to exp explain why that hurts them, but indirectly over the long run, that will hurt someone. Um, but you, like I said, you have to use a little bit of bias here and there to make small practical decisions. But the idea to eliminate racism is to get rid of the bias where it counts. So it doesn't matter what race someone is, I'm going to treat them, I'm going to let them be my friend. It doesn't matter what race someone is, I'm not going to assume someone committed a crime more than someone else for what I decide should happen for them. Okay, I might think that one person is more likely to have committed a crime, if that's what the statistics say, but it doesn't mean, it doesn't, I don't use that as um, evidence or support for the action that is actually taken against them. Okay. Um, don't use it, don't use race as, don't use race in your thinking when you're deciding whether you want to give someone food or support. Don't use race in your thinking, don't, don't use race in your thinking in such a way that it treats another race unfairly where it's going to cause more false negatives and more false positives to be different between the races. It's a really, it's probably really tricky for some people to figure that out because in their minds, it, in their minds, it doesn't make sense to a lot of people to think that one race, it's okay to think of one race as different from another, but at the same time, treat them fairly. They don't think that that makes sense, but statistically it can make sense. You, it's a decision-making process. It's a, it's math. And you won't always do everything perfectly, but you have to keep learning it and you have to keep studying it. And you can't just assume that you understand how to, how to do that. People, you know, people will assume that they know how to do, oh, I know how to do math. You know, I took calculus, I took, you know, algebra. And then I give them like the Ackerman function. And they can't solve it. And they're like, oh, I know math. I don't need to do that. The Ackerman function is going to teach you how to do, you know, you know, recursive functions, which is a very simple concept and very important concept. And it's not going to take you that long to learn it. But if you just assume you, you're fine with math, you won't think you need to even try it or you practice it. And that's how these people think. That's how most people think. They think that they don't need to think about Bayesian. They think they're good at thinking about, you know, oh, I studied computer science. Oh, I studied math. Oh, I'm an A plus student, blah, blah, blah. I'm this or that or this or that. That's probably what they're thinking on the inside. And they'll say, well, I like Bayesian statistics more. Obviously, that makes more sense. They don't understand. They don't understand that Bayesian statistics is for, it's for a specific purpose. Frequentist statistics is for another purpose. They're both, they're just different applications of statistics. That's what they are. So, yeah, racism is bad. Don't try to eliminate racism the wrong way. The U.S. government, big companies, most people... Google, a lot of places, most people in this country eliminate racism the to totally the wrong way, totally backwards, totally upside down, backwards. They don't even know what they're doing. They don't know how to counter racism. They don't know how to fight racism. And they just take what they hear and they think if somebody says anything about, you know, two races being different or one race is more likely to commit a crime, then that's racist. And they think that hiding from the truth is how to eliminate racism when they're the ones who are causing racism so there you go understand your math correctly don't be racist <laughs> all right guys
I'll see you later.